Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you may be watching us. And welcome to this webinar, The Struggle for Democracy and Human Rights, the Role of Technology and Social Media. This is a collaborative effort from Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and its European and Eurasian Studies program, together with the French Embassy in the United States. I'm David Kramer, a senior fellow and director of the European Eurasian Studies program at FIU's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, and I want to welcome you to this session today. Today will actually be a conversation, and we're thrilled to have with us Ambassador Philippe Etienne, who is France's ambassador to the United States, a position he has held since May of 2019. He has held numerous positions before that, including with the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, was ambassador of France to Romania, director of the cabinet of Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, permanent representative of France to the European Union, ambassador to Germany, and most recently diplomatic advisor to the president. And, and Ambassador Etienne is an expert on the European Union and continental Europe, and has held posts in addition to those embassy positions, ambassador positions, in Moscow, Belgrade, Bucharest, Bonn, Berlin, and Brussels. So he has extensive diplomatic experience. And we also had the privilege of hosting a conversation with the ambassador during a trip to Miami back in 2019, back when we used to meet in person. Um, and ambassador, it's, it's great to see you, albeit virtually this time again. Thanks so much to you and your team for doing this. I should also uh, want to extend a, a special thanks to your consulate here in Miami. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a great team down here. Uh, Laurent Galisseau and the whole team do a fantastic job for you representing your country. And we have developed a very uh, productive and fruitful and friendly partnership with them over, over the past years. Uh, the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet Center of Excellence and the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy along with the Dorothea Green Lecture Series are also co-sponsors of, of today's event. So Mr. Ambassador, um, today we're going to look at the struggle for democracy and human rights in the role of technology and social media as part of that struggle. But, but let's, let's start if we can uh, with a bit of the big picture here. How bad is it from where you sit, you're an ambassador now in Washington, but looking at it from the French perspective, how bad do you think the state of democracy and human rights around the world is? Um, my previous organization, Freedom House, has documented a decline of 15 years when it comes to political rights and civil liberties. The Econ Economist Intelligence Unit and others have also documented a rather steep decline. H how do you see this? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Can, can you hear me? Very well. Wow, thank you for having me first. And uh, again, I uh, I'm really happy to to meet uh, to see you again because we met the first time uh, in December uh, 2019. It was another time uh, pre. Seems like a long time ago. <laughs> but I was so happy to be with you and uh, with our friends in this uh, marvelous uh, bookshop, books and books in uh, in Miami. And I, I look forward to to coming uh, to visit you again uh, as soon as possible. And thank you for inviting me and to uh, for this so important uh, topic. Um, and um, of course, we, we, we must not uh, forget the, that after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, and we had the impression that uh, the democratic model had uh, won uh, and uh, it was done. And, uh, we must not go from this extreme, from that extreme of that time, to another extreme, which would be to, which would consist in in saying that uh, the the democracy is uh, the democratic model is defeated, not at all. But uh, indeed, we we see that uh, <clears throat> the democratic model is challenged internationally, and we see also internally that our democracies uh, face. Uh, rough times um, because there is a, a in the age of the social media and I think we will come back to this uh, the, the link between the, the challenges posed to democracies and and, uh, and internet or what how internet is implemented today we'll come back to the, this link but 
there is also a certain mis mistrust, we must be uh, honest with that, in a part of our public opinions. And this mistrust uh, towards the efficiency of our democracies, not the legitimacy, but the efficiency, the, 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 the functioning of our democracies, I think is fed by uh, the rise, by rising um, inequalities. So it is not only, uh, even if we, we, we will have to come back to this, uh, because uh, of the new model of information and um, the new way of sharing uh, news or opinions, it's also linked to the fact that uh, there is, um, partly for good reasons, the impression or the perception of, uh, of rising inequalities and rising inequalities in, in, in the opportunities our citizens have. So well, this is um, uh, what I can say. Uh, it, again, it, uh, we, we can fight against those negative trends and we do it, we fight. And one of the conditions to fight uh, efficiently is, uh, is to show that democracies are the most efficient to tackle the problems people are facing. But another condition, I think in the success of uh, our fight for democracy is that, that democracies need to work closely together. In, you know, I think it was Winston Churchill who famously said, um, democracy is the worst system, except exactly. for all the others. Exactly. I, I thought of this uh, famous... Uh, I wasn't uh, sure if you as French ambassador wanted to invoke Winston no, Churchill, no, no, but no, nevertheless... No, no. He was, a, he, yes, he was a great, great, uh, not only great Britain, he was, he, he, Britain, he was a great man and uh, he... Great statesman. It's a great statesman and uh, it's, um, it's exactly that. We have problems, we have fragilities, but we are convinced it's the best system we can have for our people and for ourselves. And as we dive deeper into this, let me just let our viewers know that you can submit questions through the Q&A function, which I think you can find at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to those in the second part of the program, but we really would welcome your questions or comments if you have some as well. So please feel free to send those in. So let, let, me, let me ask you, we, I, I would imagine you don't wanna to get too much into the US scene here, but um, it, it's I think inarguable that the United States went through one of its uh, gravest challenges um, after the election on November 3rd and the months following and, and the terrible attack on January 6th. From a European perspective, um, what was the sense when the United States itself was going through such a, a struggle and such a difficult time? Well, f first, uh, everybody was shocked by, the, by the, uh, these events uh, uh, on the Capitol Hill. Also relief uh, when the Congress reconvened on the very same day, which was really important, I think, has shown that the democracy has prevailed on that day. But finally, also the sense of the maybe the fragility of our democracies and the necessity to tackle the problems we already mentioned. And you know, in France, um, we had a two, three years ago, also some, uh, some events, the, the so-called uh, Yellow Vests movement. Uh, and um, so we, on the 6th of January, I think that many French people, if not all, everybody who, 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 could, who was there, uh, um, uh, looking at what, uh, what happened in, in Washington, we, 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 there was a sense of solidarity also of concern at the beginning uh, because the US is uh, such um, important for the idea of democracy all over the world, um, but also a sense of solidarity and uh, uh, something which was of, of interest to us because we, we have the same challenges in our democracies. And I remember that our president, President Macron, made a, a statement in the night uh, uh, on that day to, to, to express this solidarity with, uh, with uh, the American democracy. And he, he mentioned not only Lafayette, but also Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, who has written last in, in the 19th century about the democracy in America. So we felt it deeply, really deeply, for all those reasons. Pre President Biden has 
made it clear that he plans to put democracy and human rights prominently on his foreign policy agenda, as well as domestically, trying to fix the problems we face here in the United States. And he plans to convene a summit for democracy uh, later this year. Can you talk a little bit about um, the areas of partnership and collaboration between the US and France in particular, but the European Union perhaps more broadly, when it comes to trying to support and advance democracy and human rights? Well, first, I think that on democracy and human rights, of course, we must avoid to give the impression to teach uh, others lessons or to, to give the impression that uh, uh, some parts of the world are able to, to live in a, in a better way than others. It, 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 it is obviously very important. But on the other hand, we must be very firm on our principles. And we in France consider that, in particular, that human rights are a universal value and um, uh, also as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, human rights are central to the work of the United Nations. Um, so uh, we, we think that uh, again, this is for everybody uh, and everybody has the right, the, every, every, has uh, the same rights. And we must um, we must try to to cooperate uh, um, globally to to promote these rights. Uh, in France, we we are in particular committed to certain uh, of those rights as a as a in, in the framework of our diplomacy. But globally, a priority: human rights and democracy. And more specifically, some issues are very very much uh, on on the forefront. One one of the issues, for instance, which is of a which is something um, also quite um, actual in the US is uh, the uh, abolition of the death penalty, for instance. Virginia has just uh, abolished uh, the death penalty yesterday, but combating impunity, uh, equality between uh, women and men, uh, um, the, the, the fight against discriminations based on sexual orientation, on gender identity, um, we have some some uh, more specialized um, combats, uh, especially inside the UN system, where those and other issues are very important for us and for the European Union as such, because we share very much our policies on human rights with other members, nations, members of the European Union. So we we welcome the idea of a summit for democracy in this respect based on the ideas, again, that uh, we, we want to uh, uh, um, show uh, through concrete projects and through concrete cooperations that we can advance some, uh, some uh, very, very strong uh, ideas. And uh, with, we have common challenges, as I said, between our democracies. One, one of them is the manipulation of information, for instance. Probably we'll come back to this or um, um, how to use uh, internet and the cyberspace uh, or not to use it. Uh, so we have the experience in France through the Paris Peace Forum, which was created in 2017. I don't know whether you have heard of it, but the Paris Peace Forum was, was created um, as, a, as a civil society organization in, uh, in, in 2018, actually. The first meeting was in November 2018. Now there is one meeting of the Paris Peace Forum every year in November. And we tried to, to, to invite uh, civil society organizations to present uh, at this Paris Peace Forum projects advancing democracy and human rights. So we um, we are very, very much in favor of the, the, the this uh, ideas uh, behind the, the initiative announced by the United States to organize a summit. As you said, for democracy, it is not about saying uh, you are not a democracy, you are a democracy. It's about promoting concretely our ideas through coalitions of people also with a civil society, with a business, not restricted to countries and to, but, and to be at the same time very far, firm on our values and to, to fight uh, together for these values. So we, we've touched on some internal challenges we as democracies face. I'd like to 
ask you about some of the external challenges we face, uh, in particular coming from authoritarian regimes in, in Russia and China. Earlier this week, uh, the European Union imposed some sanctions on some Chinese officials uh, over the uh, treatment of Uyghurs. The United States joined as well. Uh, uh, let's start with China. How do you see um, uh, the similarities and or differences between the EU and the United States when it comes to dealing first with China and then we can turn to Russia? Because the, the European Union has also adopted Magnitsky-like sanctions for uh, human rights abuses uh, against uh, uh, officials who engage in that kind of behavior. No, absolutely. No, I see uh, mostly similarities and the last uh, example uh, underlines those similarities because we have adapted the sanctions uh, um, at the same time on the same issue, which is a treatment of Uyghur. My, uh, the, but uh, also similarities in the way we handle it because you mentioned the, the, the new instrument adopted by the European Union, which was used for the first time which uh, sometimes is called uh, the European Magnitsky Act. Right. Well, in, in spite of all differences between our systems in the, between the EU and the United States, indeed there is a, a same inspiration. So we, um, it is not only that we, we have uh, similarities in, in selecting the, the, the issues in the world where we think we should uh, act, but also the, in the way we are acting uh, through such legislations, which is uh, fairly new for the European Union. Obviously, with China, we want as much as possible to, to improve things. And we, um, for instance, we, we uh, concluded politically at the end of last year, a new investment agreement uh, between the EU, European Union and China. And one of the topics we have um, uh, inserted is, uh, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, commitments against um, forced labor. So we, we want to advance uh, on these issues uh, uh, also in, uh, in engaging with uh, the countries, of course. Uh, it's not uh, that we like or we love sanctions. Uh, we, 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 we prefer, of course, to cooperate, to advance. And uh, we, we are not, um, we know we are not perfect either and we say it and but we, we want to to advance concretely and uh, unfortunately sometimes sanctions are necessary and um, uh, we, we can see it also with Russia we we have um, quite similar um, policies and, and actions here between the US and, and the European Union and let me just very quickly explain our viewers may be aware but Magnitsky legislation was passed by the US Congress at the end of 2012 that was specifically targeted for Russian officials who uh, engage in gross human rights abuses. It was then extended in 2016 to, to deal with the entire globe. And then as we've discussed, the, the European Union has now adopted this um, uh, kind of approach uh, this but, year, I think it was. But, but a horizontal one, it is a horizontal e Exactly, exactly, not, not a country Magnitsky specific. By, by comparison, but it is not focused at the beginning on one one country it, it exactly. can be used in general exactly so let, let, let me we, we, you mentioned russia at the very end of your last answer and you served in moscow um it, it does seem that the biden administration is taking a fairly tough approach at least in the early days when it comes to uh, human rights concerns in russia and of course uh, uh, France, together with Germany, I think, was in the lead in pushing for sanctions over the poisoning of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see the European and U.S. perspectives with a new administration in Washington when it comes to dealing with, with Russia on these issues. Well, Russia, uh, contrary to China, is directly our neighbor is a, a, on the European continent. So we have... but. But like China, we also always said we want to speak with, uh, with the Russians about our common problems. But the fact that we engage this dialogue with Russia doesn't mean we are not also with them when it's about what happens uh, with Russia or in Russia very, very clear and very firm on our uh, attitude. So you gave the example of uh, Navalny, you could have mentioned uh, Skripal, which uh, was uh, two yes. years before. It's not only in that case uh, a question of uh, human rights, although it's primarily, um, of, of course, a very, very, very 
serious uh, uh, violation of human rights, but it's also and it's also very serious about the use of chemical uh, chemical substances as weapons mm -hmm. against uh, citizens. Uh, Skripal was even on the territory of uh, another country uh, in the United Kingdom. So this is this adds a dimension, which is uh, that we we have uh, international conventions against the use of such. Uh, uh, such chemical um, uh, weapons, and so uh, it's uh, it's really important to uh, not to to. It's really important to react. We cannot uh, we cannot stay without reactions. Let me ask you one more question, and then we'll shift to the uh, social media and technology parts of this. Do, do you view what we're facing today as an ideological struggle? Is it? democracy versus authoritarianism, uh, or, or is it um, simply specific regimes that are pushing back? How do you, is it an ideological battle that we're facing? Well, I think we have specific situations, but it's also a more horizontal uh, battle. Um, and again, not only uh, outside, but also inside. And for me, Finally, it's very much about, um, to come back to our point of departure, uh, to show, to, 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 to prove to, to our citizens that we are able to tackle the problems they face. Hence what, what I said about um, raising inequalities in the world, but also inside our societies. This is, a, this is an issue. And for me, the, the most important issue is uh, and I think it is what we are doing, but we, we could be better and we must be better uh, if we want to, to be efficient against the rise of uh, illiberal or authoritarian trends. We must really make the case for democracies that they are the best, as Winston Churchill said, the least worst system to, to tackle the real issues of people. The real issues of people um, including uh, insecurity, terrorism as a threat to our societies, inequality of opportunities when people think they, they are discriminated in any, any kind of way, um, um, how to tackle migration uh, issues, uh, um, how to organize a recovery after such a pandemic. Those are the issues of people, and they think of themselves. They think also of their children, grandchildren, the future. This is uh, what we, I think, would be um, the most important to to defend our democracies. Finally, great. And and I see a few questions coming in. Please, again, for viewers, feel free to send questions in through the Q and A function. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can post questions there, and and uh, my colleagues will make sure I get those questions as well. Let me, let me focus now um, for, for a little bit on the technology and social media side when it comes to the struggle for democracy and human rights. And what, with the internet and then with social media, the hope was that people living in repressive societies would finally be able to be exposed to the outside world more than they had. And to a large extent that has happened, but at the same time, we do see some of these authoritarian regimes using social media and other means as a way of surveillance, tracking, um, and disinformation. And so I wonder if you could uh, give us your take on how you and, and France, as well as the European Union, perhaps, see this phenomenon of social media and technology as it relates to the struggle for democracy and human rights. Well, obviously, social media, internet at the very beginning, social media now, themselves are uh, an incredible opportunity, both for um, growing our economy, for creating value in our in our countries, but also through innovations, but also for the society. Uh, it's incredible what we can do. For instance, thanks to to uh, to, to those platforms, we. We could, like today, with you, exactly <laughs> overcome the lack of contacts of uh, in person uh, due to to the pandemics. So we we, we cannot ignore uh, these uh, incredible opportunities. But remember, uh, in still in the 90s, at the beginning, 
when um, when uh, of the rise, incredible rise of internet, internet was a, a, an instrument of openness, of liberty. Uh, now, as you say, there are on one side some countries which use internet by a with, by a combination of censorship and uh, dis disinformation to to advance their own agendas, but they're also on the other side, um, business models which which have grown, which are not at all the small startups of the beginning, but uh, big, big, big businesses, which are have been very successful also, but we, which are themselves very, very powerful, uh, not only on the market, but finally in the society. Society also, so we we face quite an, a new a new uh, well not a new uh, because it's, it has been lasting for some years already. But compared with the beginnings of internet, it's completely different for for the two reasons. And we have to face this and to ask ourselves what we should do. In in the issue of disinformation, um, misinformation and disinformation, they're they're related obviously, but there there are differences between the two. It can be coming from both internal sources as well as external sources. How do you see the European Union uh, tackling this challenge and threat? Well, it's like uh, in the US, you know, we, I, I think your, your di distinction is very relevant. We, we must tackle it through answering the external challenges which means uh, organizing our defense, defensive instruments. And uh, uh, when you see disinformation campaigns, including during electoral uh, election times, but not, not only that, you have to, to first to identify them and also, and then to, 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 to make them in a way to, to to, to explain them, to expose them, to expose mm -hmm. them. But this challenge is maybe um, the most obvious, but there is another one, which goes to the, to, in combination with the first one, which makes the, seg the first one possible. It is that the, 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 new, the new developments uh, in the social media make every, if I, if I may say so, create a sort of um, equality between quality informations uh, written by professional journalists and anything thrown uh, through the social media at anybody, at everybody. So it was not like that before. Again, it is a progress now to have this uh, possibility, incredible possibility of uh, disseminating, exchanging opinions. But the danger, the downside is that uh, uh, I think the people, it's more difficult for all of us to, 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 to make the difference between, um, for instance, an information which has been professionally um, uh, recouped, uh, confirmed uh, according to the, the best uh, journalist, journalism practices and something which has not been at all um, looked at from this point of view, and which might even be the result of a disinformation campaign, of a manipulation, of, of a, a manipulation. So internally, we have this huge challenge of um, educating our kids, our, our new generations. I, I think it, it, it would be great to have um, efficient uh, programs in the schools. The, then our citizens are free, of course, to believe what they want, and they must. The freedom is absolutely essential. But they must given. They must be given the tools to 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 try to make the difference, or to try to to have to make their own judgment and to 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 understand uh, uh, that there can be differences between different different ways of uh, of um, disseminating informations or things looking like informations. And, and we do see also that um, some of the tools we, we use that all of us use, I guess maybe you can't see it against my background, but the, you know, I'm holding up my iPhone, um, that some governments use these tracking devices to keep an eye and follow their citizens for surveillance purposes. Mm. Um, how, do, how does that, how is that viewed? I, I, Europe seems to attach significant emphasis on the, uh, privacy 
rights of individuals. No, so if you could describe that. No, the European model uh, for uh, the digital the digital economy is based on uh, on the idea that a certain amount of regulation is necessary. And the first priority in this regulation uh, effort was privacy. This is the reason why the European Union some years ago adopted the general regulation on uh, privacy to uh, on the protection of personal data or on the protection of pri privacy. Uh, and uh, this uh, instrument, which is a law, it is a legislation common to all uh, member states of the European Union, which had been adopted by all of them and the European Parliament, is now, I think, um, a reference because we see uh, in all some, some other parts uh, in the world uh, a big interest for this. It creates, obviously, uh, a, a certain amount of burden for businesses or for um, any organization in society because you have then to abide by this regulation and to protect the privacy of the personal data you use. And so you, we, you must be cautious because the use of data is uh, one of the new uh, treasures of the, of the new economy, of course. But we think it's also the only way to give, uh, uh, to, to, to succeed in the development of the digital economy because otherwise people do not trust. And in Europe, people are very, can be very mistrustful uh, of the way uh, their personal data are used. So this regulation has really been important. And I, I think that in some, some uh, states in the United States, uh, in particular in California, I think there is also now, we have seen in the last year some, uh, some uh, uh, decisions to, uh, to try also or, or to regulate actually um, this issue of privacy. So this is the first, uh, this was the first priority, but we see there are other, other issues of regulation or of a regulatory type we can, uh, we can come back to, which are now also very important. So let me ask you one more question and then I'm gonna to turn to the uh, viewer questions and we're, we're getting some great ones. So I appreciate uh, those of you who are sending in your, your questions. Um, I, I can't resist asking Mr. Ambassador, when Twitter decided to um, take down Donald Trump's uh, account, uh, what was the reaction in Europe? There, there were some accusations, as you know, here in the United States, that this was an act of censorship when censorship really is an a act by a government, not by a private party. But then there are others who say that uh, uh, this is operating within the public domain so that there were issues concerning that. How, how, how do you and, and France and the European Union see that? Well, first, um, um... I think your question is about the reactions. The 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 uh, your question is more the systemic question, independently from what uh, uh, happened in in the United States at that. Mm -hmm. at that uh, it, so I will I will on, only answer the systemic dimension of this mm -hmm. uh, your question. Indeed, we had reactions in the in in Europe uh, on because in. Uh, in Europe, it seems a bit strange that private companies take such responsibilities, which have so so big effects on the, on the public life, on the functioning of our democracy. So, um, it might have been the I don't know the, from the point of view of these companies, uh, it, it, maybe it became absolutely necessary to do that. I'm I'm aware of the complexity of the issue, of course, but. We, we, we have to, to look at this also uh, in a longer perspective and maybe, and it, it was a reaction by some, some people in Europe, to ask ourselves whether we should not have some organization in our society to, to play this role. Um, um, should it be um, the role of the big platforms um, internet platforms to, to, to take such decisions. And I think this is also now uh, 
this question uh, is also well understood by the, the platforms themselves, because I see how some of them even ask for regulations now on different subjects. And we have made progress, for instance, between, uh, I don't know whether you know what is a Christchurch call. So the Christchurch call was uh, issued by New Zealand and France with a number of other countries and CEOs of platforms two years ago. It's, it's not the, at all the situation uh, you mentioned, but it was after uh, terrorist attacks in, uh, in New Zealand, you know, and mm -hmm. we have, after this call to action, Chris Christchurch call to action is a complete title. We have, start, we, we have developed a good dialogue with the tech platforms on, uh, and the, here's the issue was how to prevent the dissemination of content of uh, terrorist or, or extremist, violent extremist contents. And um, so it, uh, it has also something to do with, uh, with um, uh, what is happening inside our societies. Christchurch was not a terrorist, um, uh, a jihadist or a Islamist terrorist. It was against uh, Muslim citizens. So we have to combat all forms of uh, violent extremism and terrorism, of course, everybody agrees on that. But we have also to, uh, if you want to be efficient, to fight against those uh, phenomena on the internet. So we cannot leave this to the sole only responsibility of uh, of those companies of those platforms. It must be. It must be. It is a public order priority. We we cannot uh, um, uh, um, uh, leave it to the responsibility of uh, of, of private uh, of the private sector. So I. I, I drifted from uh, the answer to your question, but I think it is important to to put it, the, your question and my answer in a in a more global uh, context, which is what is the role of the governments? What is the role of the company? Of the what is the role of the courts of the yes. the ju judicial system? We have also in Europe, like in the US, we have independent regulatory bodies, which are not far from the not courts, but which are independent, but public. We have parliaments, we have uh, governments, we have uh, NGOs, we have the private sector. What, what is the role of these different stakeholders in such, uh, in such cases? It's really important to, to ad address this issue. Absolutely. Well, let, let me, let me um, uh, turn to some questions that we're getting in from our viewers. I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna combine two from Facebook and my colleagues have passed them along. One is from, uh, Pascal Fabre um, and asked, don't you think education is the key? And, and don't you think education systems have been too slow to adapt? And let me tack on the other question. It doesn't have a name uh, attributed to it, but deep fakes represent a serious threat for human rights since some extremists are using social media to manipulate public opinion. What can be done to fight them? Thanks for those questions. And I'll, I'll get to the others uh, after, after we hear from the ambassador on these. Well, I think the first question is the answer to the second question, because uh, education <laughs> probably is the most efficient way to uh, um, um, educating people, starting with a young public to, to, to recognize what is a deep fake and to give, to give our citizens instruments of ana an to analyze uh, what, they, what, what they see on, uh, on their screen. Uh, but it, it is uh, the first question. Uh, the um, the is also really important and relevant because uh, we are too slow, and we the technological changes are so quick that uh, it's not easy to adapt our education systems to to this uh, now very high priority. Um, but to, to come back to the second question, of course, uh, we must also um, have other answers. Uh, education is probably the most powerful in the long term and the most important, but we must also, in some cases, we must also react against uh, um, uh, um, really fake, deep fakes uh, or fake news when it's about manipulations which can uh, endanger, of course, a fortiori, uh, still more if it is uh, um, fake news 
which can lead to, to terrorist acts, which is an extreme situation which does exist. I don't know whether you, you remember this French teacher which has, who has uh, killed and beheaded on a- Beheaded, uh, yes. Uh, and the, the murderer who didn't live there, he came from, uh, I don't know, 100 kilometers from the, the place where- I think he, Chechnya, wasn't it? He, 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 he used, well, he, he, he reacted to, to news, to fake news on social media. Exactly. Where other people had accused this teacher of doing things he had not done. Exactly. So it's a, it's a, a chain of events, of events, which, uh, which is really, uh, which shows how it is important here. Uh, education, of course, is, um, is not enough. You, you must act, you must act quickly. Uh, in the case of some of these uh, fake news, uh, to remove to remove contents, and then you have all, all other type of situations. For instance, interference in elections by through fake news and deep fakes. Even we 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 must also have uh, our own provisions regulations, as we have in France. We, uh, after what happened in tw 2017, we we voted a legislation to to. Uh, to, to make possible an intervention, uh, a very quick intervention in, in, in time of, uh, in the electoral times. So we have a, a number of answers depending on the situation and on, on the damage these deepfakes can, uh, can create. So um, uh, there are more questions here and one comes from one of my students, uh, Victoria Burge, and, and she asked, you talked about authoritarian countries using technology to spread myths and disinformation, but what about the trend of far-right violent extremism groups and individuals using the same strategies, tactics to spread conspiracy theories, hate speech, and incitement to violence on social media to undermine democracy and human rights? Great question, Victoria. Thank you. And a very, very uh, relevant question. When, when it's about incitement to when it's about violent extremism i think it's um the answer must be very 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 firm and we we must hear uh, uh for terrorists or violent extremist contents we must here have a, a very efficient alliance between governments and uh, companies and this is what we do when I refer to the Christchurch call. Um, otherwise, if it is um, manipulation by internal groups, well, it, com it comes to, um, to the same point. We, we must support, I think, very much all those, starting with journalists, who have uh, decided to uh, um, themselves to... to um, to react and to um, to to continue to to put real informations, quality informations, um, on on the forefront of what can what can uh, be seen by by the public. We have in French, for in, in France, for instance, we have an um, uh, an organization of uh, journalists, which is an NGO, which is I think. Now, worldwide organized journalists without board, uh, um, we, which is a uh, reporter sans frontières, reporters without borders. reporters without borders. Yeah, a fantastic organization. Yes, they, they they have decided to 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 organize themselves and to to create um, to invite very uh, personalities, independent personalities to uh, to to propose. Um, uh, um, actions, and we have to support them. It cannot be only the, the government, it must be the civil society and especially the journalists and the organization of journalists, but also the, the news outlets. This is really important that we are there on their side, but we cannot as democratic governments replace them, of course, because we are not authoritarian regimes. We do not decide what is a good information or not, but we must promote actions by the civil society and by especially by, by the press. So let me combine two questions that we've got. One from uh, Michelangelo Delisi, um, and he asks, uh, in your view, do you think that technology and social media could be used 
in contrast to promote, improve, and defend democracy with initiatives such as deliberative e-democracy, liquid democracy, live polling, independent fact-checking on social media. And then along with that, um, Miriam Vieira asks, how can we work together to address the threats to democracy and human rights around the world using social media and technology to our advantage? Thanks yes. to both for those questions. Yes, which are um, uh, similar and I, I, I am very grateful because we think we, um, in, in France, since 2018, we organized, and it is uh, chaired by our president, meetings with CEOs of uh, internet companies, uh, and not only tech platforms, but companies from all, 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 all the economy because everybody now is going digital, all services. And, and the, you know the name of these um, uh, meetings, it is Tech for Good, Tech for Good. Because the two questions are absolutely correct. Not only we, as I said at the beginning, internet, social media, it's very positive. And we, we can use this, we, we, we don't want only to, to be defensive, we can use these uh, technologies and um, to promote uh, democracy. We can use these technologies uh, to promote participation to elections and uh, like uh, some, some organizations are doing. We can, uh, we can use these uh, organization, these uh, technologies to promote a, a counter narrative uh, in favor of uh, the values of tolerance and to counter uh, hatred speech. So we, we, we can uh, really um, uh, take, and we have to take many initiatives to um, which I, I, I sum up uh, with the, the, the notion of tech for good uh, to, um, um, to defend our values precisely where they are or they could be attacked and uh, we have to be to be the best and to be the most uh, proactive. And it is- So let me combine, sure, let me combine two more um, that are along these lines about, about social media. And one comes from uh, Vladimir Stupel. I, I hope I've got his last name right. Um, and he, he thanks you for the interesting uh, conversation. His question is how to push back against the alternate reality which is often created by the authoritarian countries like China and Russia on the internet. And then Marie Parker has a bit of a different question, but um, isn't an issue in America, who gets to decide what's offensive? And this gets a little bit at our conversation earlier about Twitter's decision uh, dealing with, with Donald Trump's account. Um, so um, how, how to push back against the alternate reality and who gets to make these decisions? Well, I like very much the um, the expression of alternate reality because some some of these regimes really create this uh, from the scratch or some organizations, and they, I remember some uh, some some months ago the a new legislation in was proposed to the French Parliament, and um, uh, I remember very precisely how it was completely. Uh, um, turned around and presented uh, by some people who had interest to do that as exactly the contrary of what it was. So we, we, we have to accept that it will happen. Uh, and uh, we have to, when we, as, as, a, as democracies or as a, uh, newspapers, papers or TV channels or uh, we, we have to each 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 of us we will have his, his role and will decide for himself but or herself but I think we um, so there is not one answer because it depends who you you are in the society but uh, I am I am I represent a, a government uh, a, and we, we think that we have as a, as democracies as democratic governments also to to work together and to to look uh, how we can uh, fight efficiently again uh, disinformation and manipulation informations and um, I don't come back to to the different situations I already mentioned and the second question also is uh, so important because what who who is who has to take responsibilities when there is some uh, uh, 
dangerous content, for instance, uh, to put it down. I think, again, we have so many different situations. We have a, at one extreme content such as a, a, a pedopornography on the one end or terrorist and uh, extremist violent contents things which are so harmful that you have to act and the the more harmful it is the more the intervention of law of regulations of governments is, is necessary and then you have other cases where uh, probably there is a combination uh, more there is more self-regulation more uh, action by inside the society by those who have to to act what is sure is that Two, uh, two things. First, um, you will always have, because we are democracies, a combination of uh, action by the governments and action by private actors, because we are now multi-stakeholder societies and these issues cannot be tackled only by the public sphere or only by the private sphere. It must be a combination and an, an alliance between the two. And second, very important thing, we are states where um, we obey the rule of law. We obey the rule of law, which means that at, there must always be a possibility of redress and uh, before the courts. We are in a, our democracies uh, must uh, give the possibility to, to use um, um, the courts in, 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 in all directions. When it is too dangerous, you have to, for instance, to, to act immediately. But of course, you must protect uh, freedom, not only freedom of speech, the freedom in, freedoms in general, by these possibilities. When, for instance, a citizen considers that his private data has been misused because he has given them to one organization, which has then sold them to another organization without his consent, he must be able to go to the courts. This is really important in all situations. So uh, we, we don't have much time left. Let me try to get in a couple more questions if we can. Um, Douglas Yoder uh, wrote in um, conveying what President Biden said in his first press conference this afternoon, that there is a great challenge, not just for the United States, to demonstrate that democracy can continue to work in the face of worldwide conditions, including cyber issues and social media. He, meaning President Biden, specifically pointed to the leaders of China and Russia as exemplifying the belief that authoritarian rule rather than democracy can only manage these challenges. He'd welcome your comment to that. Well, this is a, a real, uh, the, the real issue uh, for the future, who is the most efficient or who is the most efficient to protect his own model and also to promote his own model to, to, to third countries because this competition between model uh, is, uh, is not only, um, we, we, we quote always the same countries, uh, including Russia and China, but consider the whole world. Well, what is the future of all our nations? Uh, um, it's for each people to choose its uh, its own system, and uh, it's really important that uh, we um, we uh, we are able to show the uh, that our model is uh, is the best one. So it's it's really important um, to um, to be aware there is this competition of models uh, where we have our own instruments. Uh, uh, which are openness, tolerance, uh, and the defense of, uh, of human rights and democracy. Um, but we must be uh, also aware, we must not be naive, uh, we must be aware that it is a true competition. Um, I think the question was also about cyber security and cyber yes. attack. So uh, this, this is more and more serious. This is more and more serious. And it's not only, it's, it goes well beyond uh, disinformation. So cyber, cyber security is about the functioning of our healthcare, uh, energy grids, healthcare in, uh, infrastructure. So this is now something which is at, this, it's, uh, at the top level of our security. It's not, it's not like, um, uh, maybe a military power as it was before, but it's uh, as important. It's our, our 
core security which is uh, which is uh, at stake so we know that uh, it, the international uh, life uh, the notion of security is expanding uh, the notion traditional notion of security is not what it was before uh, and we know there are two new 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 spaces new 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 domains where our security is at stake the first space is cyber and the second one is over our heads the outer space which is yes. more and more a, a uh, so it is not only land sea and air but it's also cyber and outer space yes and, and you i would just add mr master you, you mentioned um, the the various hacks and other things um, the solar winds obviously the hack here in the united states got a lot of attention what received less attention were russian hacks into American medical facilities and medical research institutes that frankly are not the sign of a, of a friendly power to say the least. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me squeeze in one more question from our viewers. Again, thanks so much to, to our viewers for sending in some great questions. Um, and Danny Taro, I, I hope I got your last name right, Danny. First, thanks you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for, for your, your remarks. Um, he, he asked, going forward with the significant changes currently being seen in the international system, how would the EU manage the need to work with, say, China, for example, such as the new trade deal that was struck at the end of December, um, yet at the same time imposing sanctions? How do you square this reality with idealism, as Danny puts it? Well, it's, uh, it's a combination, you know, uh, when you speak with a a big power like China, uh, and I think here we are on the same page, uh, United States, I mean the, the new administration and, and, and Europe, we, we have uh, different, uh, different domains and where we are um, rival, uh, where we are competitors and where we have to discuss also, so it is not, uh, it is not different in Europe from the United States. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, the, um, the cyber issue is uh, is uh, is really uh, is really important. And I mentioned already that the investment agreement, which was concluded last December, and the question mentions this, is not only a trade or investment uh, agreement. We have inserted we Europeans we have inserted for the first time in negotiations with this uh, big partner, provisions on sustainability and against forced labor. So uh, it could show a, a path. Well, I don't know whether it will be easy. I'm sure it will be not, it will not be very easy, but we, we, we have to, to insist on our values also when we, when we discuss such, uh, such agreements. And I think I even saw some rumblings among some members of the European Parliament saying uh, that uh, they might hold up ratification of the deal after the Chinese reaction to the sanctions that were imposed uh, earlier this week. So it'll be an interesting time for you and France and Europe, as well as for the United States when it comes to dealing with these um, very weighty challenges. Mm. Uh, this has been a, a, a terrific conversation, Mr. Ambassador. I, for the past year, I've done a fair share of these webinars and the best sign of the best of them is that they go quickly and this one went very quickly and and so i'm really grateful to you for this um, we, we have some colleagues on each side uh, with your embassy um, my thanks again to your your team for hosting us uh, on, on zoom today your consulate down here in miami laurent natalie and the team uh, just great to work with my colleague, Christine uh, Kali Sanchez here in the Europe Eurasia program, uh, without whom none of this would happen. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm particularly grateful, Mr. Ambassador, to you for taking an hour of your time from a very busy schedule uh, for making it possible for us to have a, a fascinating conversation. I'm really grateful to you. Um, so Ambassador uh, Philippe Etienne, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, this has been a, a uh, webinar on the struggle for democracy and human rights, the role of technology and social media, a conversation with France's ambassador to the United States. I'm David Kramer, director of the European Eurasian Studies Program at Florida International University, Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. 
My thanks to all of you for joining us, and I wish you the best in health. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. All the best.